Oh, it's so great to have little, little voices and little feet, little hands in, among us. And thank you to our volunteers. We continue our sermon series on the parables in the Gospel of Matthew, Secrets of the Kingdom. And today we are at Matthew chapter 20, talking about the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 20. And uh, if you do not have a Bible today, that's okay. We have our uh, insert listening guide to follow along with. Most of our important scriptures will be on the screen. And also, you may recognize or notice that there is a Bible pretty near close to, close to you in the seat back or seat bottom. And if you would like a Bible and you do not have one, please take that home And that will be our gift to you. Or even if you know someone who needs a Bible and you want to share with them, um, those Bibles are our evangelistic gift to you. And so Matthew chapter 20, we're talking about the parable in the vineyard. And I was thinking as I was preparing this lesson, I thought about a deacon back in Missouri, a good friend of mine named Steve. And uh, he had a saying, and every time I would see him, good evening, Steve, how are you doing? And he would look at me very sincerely and say, better than I deserve, better than I deserve. And I'm sure he didn't make that saying up, but boy, did he own it, and he, he made it his own. And I really thought about that uh, for this message, because this message communicates that rich truth, that we've all been treated better than we deserve. So the scripture is Matthew 20 verses 1 through 16, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And Jesus is talking to the disciples here, and he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius, basically the common wage, minimum wage, or um, a denarius for the day, and then he sent them to his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about noon, and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. Verse 8, When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius, the same pay. When they received it, They began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Amen to the reading of God's word. Anytime you come to a passage of Scripture that you can see within that the characteristics or the attributes of God, it's good to take note of that and to write that down and to meditate on the character of God. And so right off the bat, 
Before I really get into the sermon, I have a mini-sermon about the characteristics of God. And there's three attributes from this parable that really jump off the page, worthy of our attention. And one of them is that God treats no one unfairly. In fact, God treats us far above and beyond what we consider by labeling that word fairly. So God is just. God is just. You know, nobody, when, when especially us in, in the kingdom, when we're saved, when we have that relationship with God and that home in heaven, no, nobody, when we get to heaven, will be able to legitimately complain, that's not fair. That's not fair. Nobody's going to say that. God is just and fair. For example, I think about when Abraham prayed uh, on behalf of, uh, of wicked Sodom for them to be spared, he says, you know, well, what if there's some righteous people there? Surely you wouldn't uh, destroy them along with the wicked. And he says this in Genesis eighteen twenty five. Abraham says, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you, God, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Of course, our God is a just God. We just need to recognize, though, that in our culture today, sometimes uh, it's communicated that justice or fairness is always sameness. And that's not always the case. Um, we're, we're different. Men and women are different. Individuals are different. Different talents and abilities and that's okay. That's how God made us. But God is just. God is also gracious. He's not just just. He's gracious, abundantly gracious. We've all been treated better than we deserve. He provides blessings to our lives that in no way do we deserve. I think about that precious hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Um, the, the author of that song was a pastor. He was a former slave trader, if you didn't know that. And that's how, where he gets that word wretchedness. In fact, in the, the, the original writing of that hymn, he called himself a worm, that God saved a worm like me. Because he felt so much guilt for, for being a slave trader, but God saved him and restored him and renewed him and became him, appointed him as a pastor. So that he said this at the end of his days, there's two things I know. I am a great sinner, but God is a great savior. God is gracious. We've all been treated better than we deserve. And this parable shows us that. And also, perhaps unexpectedly, something that we don't often think of, God is free. God is a free God. He's God not us. You know, God can bless whoever he wants to bless, however much he wants to bless them. Or for his own divine reasons and purposes, he can withhold that blessing at his discretion. Who and how much he blesses are his prerogatives. He's God, not us. In fact, the only thing that restrains God is his own holy character so that God cannot lie, God cannot sin, those kind of things. But God is free. And when we look at verses 13 through 15, we see that in the parable. I'll bounce back to that at a later time. God is just. God is gracious. God is free. But the question for us is, how do we respond to God when we identify and understand his character? And one author in my research for this message asked this probing question question that I'm going to ask you. Are you jealous or loyal? Are you jealous or loyal to the master? Because there's no room for jealousy in God's kingdom. That's your big idea for this morning. There's no room for jealousy or envy in God's kingdom. Because we've all been treated mercifully. We've all been treated graciously we're all one big family, and we need to be unified 
and encouraging and serving the Lord with hearts that are just grateful and full of joy. Now, the context of this parable, like all of them, is very important. Jesus gives this parable in response to his encounter with the rich young ruler. And maybe you remember this story. This rich young man comes, this entrepreneur comes to Jesus and says, uh, Master, what, what do I need to do to be saved? And in that Hebrew context and culture, Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And he lists a few of them. Don't steal, don't covet, don't murder. And, and, but the, the man says pridefully, I've kept all of those from my youth. And we say, yeah, right. Come on now, buddy. Really evaluate yourself with humility. You, didn't, you know you didn't do that. But, but he says, what else should I do? And, and Jesus looks at him and Mark's account of the story says that he, he loved him. And he said, well, one thing you lack, take all that you own, sell it and come follow me. Because he knew this man's heart was bound up in the idolatry of, of money and power, and he would never follow and surrender his life to God unless he let go of that. And it says that that man went away sad. He went away sad. And so Peter, in response to that, says, well, Master, we've left everything to follow you. We've abandoned everything to be your disciples. And they did back in the earliest part of the gospel. Peter himself, Andrew, James, and John, for example, even Matthew, they left behind their, their businesses and their income and their livelihood, and they, they committed to Christ to follow him. So he says, what are we going to have to show for it? And Jesus says, well, don't worry about your investment. Your investment in me is secure both now and in heaven. But the first will be last, and the last will be first. And then he tells this story, this story of the vineyards. The last, many who are first will be last and the last first. I thought, hmm, what in the world does that mean? This is one of those parables that you really have to think and ponder on. Last first and the first last. Is that some kind of new common core math that's out there? What are we talking about? Well, we shouldn't be surprised that God's kingdom operates differently than the worldly kingdoms, that there's going to be some things that are unexpected, that there's things that are topsy-turvy and upside down, and this is one of those parables that teaches us that, and we're going to unpack that right now. Here's your kingdom principle number one, kingdom workers should be busy in God's service. As I look at this parable, I notice all the desire of the Lord, who's represented by the master, to have workers in his field. Kingdom workers should be busy in God's service. The setting is a vineyard, and I come from Missouri, and we have lots of vineyards here and there in Missouri. And you can go and, and tour the vineyards. We often have weddings in the vineyards because it's so beautiful. And... Um, you can, you can go on wine tasting tours throughout Missouri. Not that I ever have because I'm Baptist, but um, you can do it. You can do it. But uh, it's a vineyard and it's ripe. And so there needs to be harvesters to come. And so the master of the house, like I said, who represents God, went early in the morning out into the marketplace to hire day laborers, workers for one day only. Um, and this was a common experience back then. They'd call up and um, back in my day, back in my day, yeah, as if I'm, you know. But uh, I remember as a young man, about 15 years old, uh, getting hired to haul hay. Anybody haul hay growing up? Yeah, it's pretty hard work, right? And uh, you drive along with the tractor and a flatbed. And these aren't the big round bales. These are the, the rectangle bales. And you have, you know, you get the, your young men to haul it up onto the flatbed, and then people are stacking it on the flatbed, and it just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. But, um, you know, the interesting thing for me was that I was a little underdeveloped at 15. I was a late bloomer, so to speak. And that was a blessing on this time, because I got to drive the truck. Here I am, 15 years old, in that air-conditioning cab, 
just cruising, you suckers. And I got the same pay as everybody else. Five, uh, five cents, a nickel a bale. Well, that day was my day. There was other times that I wasn't so lucky. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I cleaned perm rods in my mom's salon. And I don't... Anyway, what's the point? What are you even talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about being a day laborer. They were hired for a day to work. And he agrees upon a... Um, a fair paycheck, one denarius. And remember when Jesus talked about praying for your daily bread? He was being literal. The average worker back then, day laborer, had no bank account, no credit card, no savings. They were basically paycheck to paycheck. All the day's wages were used to provide for basic necessities day by day. And that's why Jesus said, you know, give us this day our daily bread, that you're to trust and trust your lives to God day by day. And so the master goes up and he agrees with a, a fair compensation. I will pay you whatever is right, he says down in verse 4. This Roman denarius was considered adequate pay for 12 hours of work. And they shook on it, so to speak, because, hey, I got money today. We don't know about tomorrow, but today I got income. And so, verse 3 through 5 introduces a little bit of a twist in the story. And remember I talked last week that uh, Jesus liked to put a twist in his stories to highlight and grab people's attention. It was provocative, and he was the master of the twist. Uh, not the chubby checker twist, but the, the plot line twist. And when he gives this twist... Um, it provokes thought. And here's the twist. The landowner, who already has plenty of workers, goes back to the marketplace to find more. At 9 a.m., they started at 6 or so, sunrise, 9 a.m., back again at noon, and back again at 3 p.m., and he finds workers just standing around. And he says, what's, what's wrong? Didn't you get hired? No, we didn't get hired. Come work in my vineyard, he says. They weren't lazy. They just weren't hired. This is unexpected because, as I said, the master should have no interest in these workers. He's already got workers. But he is investing in these unemployed workers by hiring them and pledging to pay them what is fair. And again, this 3 p.m. shift, this is not a 3 to 11. It's not shift work. They're going to, pay, they're going to work 3 to 6 and get paid what is fair. They don't know what to expect, but hey, something is better than nothing, right? Something's better than nothing. Maybe we could share a pot of ramen uh, with, a, with the family or maybe some great value red beans and rice. Whatever works us, gets us through the day. But the story isn't finished there. He says the master goes back to the marketplace at 5 p.m. The day is almost done. The, the harvest is almost in. And there's more people there, and he hires them. And they, you know, they, how could they even get on site in order to have any time to do anything? Maybe an hour, maybe 30 minutes, cleanup duty. But everybody's recognizing as they hear this story that this isn't your normal landowner. His focus is not on his profit. His focus is on the workers. His focus is on those that he was hiring his employees. So before we go any further, let's focus on the workers too. Jesus, the master, wants laborers working in his vineyard. He wants you, he wants me, he wants all of us to be busy in his kingdom service. As many as are willing. For however how much time is left, in the day, he wants us working for his kingdom. Matthew 9, 37 through 38, he said to his disciples, look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask, pray to the Lord of the harvest, our Father, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. You know, here at First Baptist Church, you are expected to serve. 
our motto on this wall out here is serving God by serving our community, by serving you. We are expected, as Pastor Bill said, to serve, not to sit, soak, and sour. And so we need to serve. And if you haven't caught on yet, we are the laborers in God's vineyard, and he wants us serving. The harvest is just as plentiful as it ever has been. So how are you serving? How can you get plugged in? It doesn't mean you have to be down here every day of the week. Uh, or, but, or even here, you can be off campus serving the Lord. Many of you do. Now, it's careful. we need to be careful not to take this illustration and this parable, this allegory too far. Because we're not earning salvation by working in God's field. We work because we're grateful. And he calls us, and it's a privilege to serve the master. But we're not earning our salvation. Kingdom citizenship, salvation, being saved, comes through the work of Jesus, what he did for us, dying on the cross so that we could be forgiven and us turning from our sins and turning to Him and asking Him for forgiveness. The work of Jesus is applied by grace through faith. And the result of trusting in Christ as Savior and Lord is eternal, abundant life and communion with Him. And that is for everyone who believes. That one basic blessing, eternal life, is for everyone. Whether it's the, the thief on the cross who didn't practically nothing, right? All he did is say, will you remember me? He wasn't baptized. He didn't become a member. He didn't take class 101. He didn't sign a covenant. He never took communion. All he did is say, Jesus, will you remember me? But then also you have John the Apostle who lived 60 more years or so after Christ was crucified. They both get the same basic reward, and no one's going to be disgruntled in heaven. No one's going to be disappointed, you know. I thought it'd be shinier. No, that's not going to happen. Everybody is going to be filled with joy and satisfaction in life, eternal life. However, there's still work to be done. There's work to be done now. There's a harvest to be gathered in. And I do believe that the Bible teaches that in, in some way our faithfulness in this life will contribute to our satisfaction and glory and reward in, in heaven. But kingdom workers should be busy in God's service. And one practical aspect, one question I want to dovetail off of that is, why do you serve? Why do you serve? Because our motivation matters. Are you in it for the income? Are you in it for the outcome? Like they say about teachers, they're in it for the outcome, not the income. And that should be our heart as well. It's real easy to get caught up in personal praise, even as a pastor. I know it. I wrestle with it every day. The Lord is very good at keeping me humble. But it's, you get attention. You, you, you get influence. It, it, it feels good to be loved and wanted and desired. But why are we serving? We need to serve because God loves us and we're grateful and it's a privilege to serve in his kingdom. Our motivation matters and we should be serving. Kingdom principle number two, kingdom workers, disciples, followers of Christ, we can trust God to reward them fairly. Kingdom workers can trust God to reward them fairly. And Jesus is going to Drive home that reality in the second half of the parable. Verses 8 through following, the, the plot thickens. The plot thickens. The workday is finally over. All the work's done, and he calls in the workers to receive their pay. And unlike today, where payment is a confidential matter, back then payment was a public affair so that everything was abo above board. Everybody could witness the transaction. But unexpectedly, the foreman begins to pay the workers in reverse order. Those who showed up last, 5 p.m., they get paid first. And guess what? They receive a full denarius, a full day's pay for one hour of work. 
How would you like that, Sonny? Yeah, you're looking at, yeah, I like that. That's what we call incentives. And you can hear the gasp from Jesus' audience as they tell the story. And immediately, every other worker starts to calculate an adjusted pay rate. Maybe I'll get three or six, nine denarii, or even 12. I started at 6 a.m., but they're, they're wrong. They don't get paid that. Verses 10 and 11, they assume wrong. They get one denarius just like the rest. And you can imagine what's going to happen. They begin to complain. They begin to grumble, it says. Just like the Israelites against Moses when they're walking through the desert. They had forgotten what it was like to be slaves in Egypt. They're grumbling we don't like this bread. We don't like this manna. We don't like quail. We're sick of that. We want to go back to Egypt and have cucumbers and onions. Now, it's ridiculous, but how often do we grumble and complain? We're complainers. That's our nature. This isn't fair. They say, those guys you hired last hardly worked any at all, and they worked when it was cool. Why did he get the same pay that, that we did? He got to ride in the truck in the air conditioning. <laughs> we were working our tails off back there. But you couldn't you blame him? Who hasn't experienced some of this to some degree? You work 20 years in a company. You work out your way up the pay scale. You invest your time, your energy, your hard work to prosper the business, and then your boss goes and hires some college upstart grad at your pay rate. That ain't fair. You know, when I moved out here, um, you knew, Sonny, that a, a fishing story was coming. <laughs> when I came out here, I recognized there's one fish in southern Utah uh, that is a prized possession. It's a hybrid bass, a mixture between a striped bass and a white bass, and they are incredibly strong they grow very big and there's a lake there and i'm not going to tell you where it is <laughs> there's a lake in southern utah that consistently produces state records so when i moved out here even before i moved out here i was doing research how to catch these fish what bait to use when to do it and all of that i did all this research and i must i must have visited this lake probably 20 25 times in three and a half years searching for these hybrid bass. And I've caught my fair share, but not that state record. But a couple of years ago, or maybe even 18 months ago, I, it was pretty recent, uh, a young guy, about 20 years old, reaches out to me in social media and says, hey, I noticed you've been hunting these fish. Can you give me some tips about how to catch them? I'm, I'm, I'm not that big of a hoarder when it comes to, I want people to have success. So I said, yeah, you use this bait, you go this time, and you'll probably have a good chance of catching a big one. He goes on his first trip, catches the Utah state record. That's not fair, God. Well, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Verses 13 through 15 shows us the master's response and teaches the whole lesson of the parable. It's the punchline, so to speak. He says, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you get paid what we agreed on? We shook on it. And it's a fair wage. Nobody's getting ripped off here. Take what is yours and go. This is fair. God is just. We're all treated better than we deserve. Verses 14 and 15, I want to give the one who was hired last the same that I gave you. Don't I have the right to do with what I want with my own money? See, God is free. He can do whatever he wants to do. He can bless whoever he wants to bless when or however he wants to bless them. Or are you envious because I'm generous, gracious? There the heart of the master is revealed. It's all about his graciousness, his generosity. His goodness. I'm the landowner. I can do whatever I want. And I thought of Colossians 3. When it comes to service in God's kingdom, 3, 23 through 24, it says, whatever you do, 
Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ who you are serving. See, we can trust God to reward us fairly. He knows the service that you do when no one is looking. He knows the prayers in your prayer clauses that no one else hears. He knows your heart and your motivation, and He will reward you fairly in the eternal day. And I thought of Sonny working at Walmart day after day. Sonny is one of those guys, you call into uh, Walmart, you want a, an online order. Sonny goes and helps organize and get that all ready so that they can hand deliver it to you. But you know, Sonny, you're not working for Sam Walton. You're working for the Lord, brother. And, and Patty. <laughs> but we're all workers for the Lord. He's our boss. He signs our paycheck. Verse 15, he says, the, the, the master says, are you envious? Are you jealous because I'm generous? The Greek literally says, are you giving me the evil eye? You know, we sometimes glare at somebody when we're mad at them. We give them the crook eye. I remember... Little Phoebe, when I'd scold her, she'd give me the stink eye. And every once in a while, she'll still give me the stink eye. No, she's sweet as can be. Don't believe it. But this phrase actually refers to hexing or cursing another. That reveals the heart of the worker. See, the heart of the, the, the owner and the master is generous, but the heart of the worker is jealous. What a toxic attitude. Verse 16 then comes to the end again. It's the same as verse, 9, or verse 30 in chapter 19 that provides the context, the bookends, if you will, for this parable. So the last will be first and the first last. Wow. Wow. So what, pastor? That's all. That's some good stories. It's a good parable. I understand it now. What does it mean to us? Here's some practical applications for you. Number one on your listening guide, your bullet point, be careful who you esteem. Be careful who you look up to. Be careful, dare I say, even who you idolize. Some of us who think very highly of ourselves may find that we are actually pretty low in kingdom importance when we come to that eternal day. Others who think lowly of themselves may find that in the eternal day they're exalted. I like the idea, says for pastors, don't lift me up on a pedestal, lift me up in prayer. Please do that. Lift me up in prayer. Don't think of me more highly than you ought. I'm a sinner just as bad as you are. Sometimes I feel like that turtle on a fence post. How did they get there? You know, somebody put them there. In my case, it's the Lord. The Lord's grace has been upon me. Grace has brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. So be careful. You know, in heaven, we may discover that that popular TV teacher with the shiny teeth and bright smile and gold rings and watches and mega church doing big time ministry, he may have less reward than the lowly preacher in a tiny church in a small mountain town that just faithful day after day after day after day. We don't know. God knows and God sees and he will judge rightly and the last will be first and those who think they are first may be last. Luke fourteen eleven. for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. James 4.10 applies it personally. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. So be careful who you look up to, who you esteem. Also, be careful how you judge or compare. See, comparison always sets you up to sin. Because when you look at others, you'll either think too highly of yourself and get proud, or you'll think too lowly of yourself and get jealous. That's the nature, that, that's the bent, our sinful bent. Be careful. Are you jealous of someone else in the church or someone else's ministry? 
How did they get in that position? I'm ten times smarter than they are. I'm ten times better than they are. Why is she teaching that Bible study? I know more, more than she is. Be careful. Be careful. We've thought of those things. Are you covetous of another's blessing? In and outside the church, it doesn't matter. I worked hard my whole life. Worked my fingers to the bone. What did I get? Bony fingers. And here this guy inherits all that money, and he is a lazy good for nothing. Be careful. How did she get that job? I applied there three times. I bet she flirted with the boss. That floozy, she flirted with the boss. I know it. Be careful. I can't believe she got engaged before me. Are you jealous of others? Or are you simply loyal to the master and entrusting him to do what is just and fair when it's right? Remember, God is free to bless whoever he wants to bless, however he chooses. We're all rescued rest, wretches like John Newton. We have no right to complain. We deserve judgment, and he gave us mercy and grace. We should be grateful and loyal, not envious. Besides, it could be your turn next month. Maybe God has on his calendar your blessing this year. We don't know. Entrust yourself to God. And I want to read James 3. 13 through 18, because this really spoke to me. Cover your belly button, Sonny. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Have you ever thought about envy or jealousy being demonic? That was stunning for me. That jumped off the page for me. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Man, did that convict me. And I hope it did to you as well because that's, that's one of the things we need. Last one, be careful who you favor. Be careful who you favor. We need to be cautious of treating wealthy and prominent Christians with more affection or more importance than the widow or the orphan or the child. Because the first shall be last and the last shall be first. I remember in Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees were complaining because all the sinners, the prostitutes and tax collectors were entering the kingdom of God and they were jealous. God wants us to apply His kingdom priorities, His kingdom blessings with a heart of grace without discrimination. In Missouri, I used to go to the Baptist State Convention, and I tell you what, boy, do we Baptist preachers like to rub elbows with the big wigs. Just put us together in a convention, and it gets ridiculous glad handing and back slapping baptist i tell you and some of those big some of those big wigs will absolutely brown nose when they need your support or money but once they get it don't be surprised if you get snubbed the next time you see them and i say that and i've committed such sins myself because we all like to we like to feel important all i'm saying is we need to be careful because God's kingdom is upside down in many ways. Again, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, James gives us another convicting lesson. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting, walking down the aisle, Whitehammer Church, wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, 
and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, here's a, a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down there by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Why did James say those things? Because the early church had problems like that. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we still struggle with that. I remember my buddy Cliff was telling me he visited a church in Hawaii, and I won't say the church or the denomination, but he went in and, and said, I'd really like to come here. When are your services? And the person who was greeting said, what makes you think you're good enough to come to our service? Can you imagine that? Let me just say, nobody needs to feel good enough. Everyone is welcome here. Robert DeMoore writes this, this final illustration before I share the gospel with you. Back in Ontario, when the apples ripened, Mom would set all seven of us down, Dad included, with pans and paring knives until the mountain of fruit was reduced to neat rows of filled canning jars. You ever did any canning growing up? Yeah. She never bothered keeping track of how many we did, though the younger ones undoubtedly proved more of a nuisance than a help. Cut fingers, squabbling over who got which pan, apple core fights. But when the job was done, the reward for everyone was the same. The largest chocolate dip cone money could buy. Now, a stickler might argue it wasn't quite fair since, since the older ones actually peeled apples. But I can't remember anyone complaining about it. A family understands it operates under a different set of norms than a courtroom. I love that story. Everyone is expected to work, to do something. Everyone's expected to serve, and everyone gets the same reward, an ice cream, no matter how much they do. See, there's no room for jealousy in God's kingdom. Rather, shouldn't we just claim that simple motto of my friend Steve? How are you, Steve? Better than I deserve, brother. Better than I deserve. It's time for our gospel presentation and invitation and again, I want to use that acrostic faith, F-A-I-T-H. Ephesians 2.8 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, through believing. And this is not yourselves. It is a gift of God. Salva salvation is by grace through faith. And so, if you're here today and you've never received Christ as Savior and Lord and put your trust fully in Him, I encourage you to do that today. Here's the facts about what you need to know. F, F is for forgiveness, the fact that we all need it. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. In Romans 3.10, there is no righteous person, not even one. Other than Jesus Christ, no one lived a perfectly righteous life pleasing God. Our number one problem is sin, and sin separates us from God so that we need forgiveness and to be reconciled with Him so that we can enjoy Him forever in eternal life. Forgiveness, A, is available. Forgiveness is available because of what Jesus has done. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 teaches us the gospel. Paul writes, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Very simply, Christ died so that we could be forgiven of our sins. He paid the punishment that we deserve so that we could experience the eternal life and reward that he deserves. He died to pay for our sins. Our sin problem is solved through Jesus. In fact, it's I impossible any other way. 
It's impossible to be saved by any other means. Ephesians 2, 9 reminds us that salvation is not a result of works or good deeds, but by grace, so that no one may boast. Titus 3, 5, God saved us, how? Not on the basis of good deeds or good works, but in accordance with his mercy, out of love. It is impossible. Me, Justin, on his holiest day, on his right, most righteous day, like Isaiah said, my righteous acts are like a filthy garment compared to the righteousness of Christ. And so what do we need to do? We need to T, turn, repent, turn from sin and turn to God. I love this passage, Acts 3, 19 through 20 commands, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repentance is just a simple U-turn. You recognize you're going the wrong way in life. You're living a life of sin, and you, don't, you want to turn away from that and turn to God and ask for forgiveness and trust that Jesus died for you and surrender your life to Him. T is for turn, and if you do that, H, heaven, is your eternal reward. Reconciliation with God, forgiveness for your sins, leading to eternal life is the result of repentance and faith. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him, whoever trusts in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how do you do that? How do we call on His name? By prayer. By simple prayer. And there's no magic formula. There's no perfect prayer that you just repeat the right words and repeat after me. And See, you don't put faith in the prayer. You put faith in Christ. The prayer is just how we apply our faith in Christ. We call it the sinner's prayer because the most important step the, the initial step is to admit your sinfulness before God in humility and ask Him to save you and to come into your heart and life. If you've never done that today, why don't you take this time between you and the Lord to just pray a prayer of repentance. And in fact, I'll, I'll slowly lead you through this. Pray with me if you're ready to give your heart and life to the Lord. God in heaven... I recognize today that I am a sinner. I've blown it. I've lived my life my own way, rejecting your way. And I recognize that I need forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me based on what Jesus has done. I know I can't save myself. And so I just throw myself at your mercy. I believe Jesus died for me and that he was raised from the dead and I want to surrender my life to him as Savior and Lord right now. So best that I know how, I simply believe and trust. I turn from my old way of life and I turn to you and ask you to save me, forgive me, make me your child. By faith, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And for the rest of us, I know most of us here are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ today. And so I'm going to pray for you now just a simple prayer about service and about grace. So why don't you pray with me now? Oh, God in heaven. Help us to have a good heart and a good attitude when it comes to our service. It's so easy to get distracted and, and envious and jealous of others. And, and Lord, we pray for your heart of mercy to come in and transform us so that we don't have that attitude, but it's replaced with gratitude and love for you. Forgive us for where we have had bad attitudes. Forgive us for when we think that by working, we're earning some kind of 
love from you because we know you love us despite our sins. And so we just, again, put faith and trust in you that you will forgive us and restore us because of what Jesus has done, not because of anything that we've done. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.